famines, wars, pestilences, and earthquakes, Jesus gave us clear indicators of how we could identify the nearness of his soon return. This week on Behold the Savior, we look at the signs of the times. The average adult makes 35,000 choices per day. Many of those decisions include a moral struggle. Every year, one out of every five people fall victim to a crime. We live in a lost and broken world full of distractions. But we all want something better. We're all searching for something. The world stands in desperate need of something. The need Sunset, I remember the words of my mother saying, Red in the night, sailors delight. Red in the morning, sailors take warning. By the condition and view of the sky, you could sort of tell what the day was going to be like the next day, whether it would be a good day or a bad day. And Jesus has given us some very clear indicators as well of how we can identify the nearness of his soon return. When Jesus and his disciples had retired to the Mount of Olives, we get one of the clearest descriptions of the nearness of Jesus' return, how we can identify it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. The disciples wanted to know when all of this sin and pain would come to an end, and there would be peace finally on planet Earth. And then Jesus lays out in a dissertation uh, some very telling events in the political world, the natural world, of how we can identify his return. And he uses another uh, parable associating it. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. And then Jesus begins his dissertation. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, he says, Take heed that no one deceives you. Now, why would Jesus say, take heed that no one deceives you? He, in John chapter 14, he tells us that he's coming soon. And then Matthew 24, he gives us these clear indicators of how we know that his return would be near. And is it possible that many of the Jews were deceived about the first coming of Jesus? They weren't expecting him to come as a little baby born in a stable in a manger in, in filth. They expected him to come as a conqueror. When we come back in Matthew chapter 24, we're going to see how we can see clearly the signs of Jesus' soon return. This is a tablet. This is also a tablet. This did not evolve from this. This is an intelligent design. This is an intelligent design. This is an ape. This is a human. This did not evolve from this. This is an intelligent design. Any questions? Understanding creation and evolution in humanity. Welcome back to Behold the Savior. Today we're looking at how we can identify how Jesus is going to come soon. And actually this is going to be a two-part message, so be sure to stay tuned next week. This week we're going to see how we can know his coming is soon, and next week we're going to see how we know that it's actually him that's coming. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, if you were living in the time of World War I or World War II, be honest, wouldn't you have thought the world was coming to an end? Destruction and pain everywhere. It looked like how much worse could it be? But there's more. 
Now we're locked in the war of terrorism. And of course, in 2001, there was the hit on the World Trade Centers, the Pentagon, and the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. And I think it was over two or 3,000 lives that were lost as a result. And that really marked the beginning of the war of terrorism, and it continues to this day. In 2016, there have been attacks at airports, there have been nightclub shootings, and on and on, and we seem to be locked in this battle. In fact, in 2015 alone, there were 391 terrorist incidences. And certainly there has always been terrorist incidences, and there's always been wars, but never like this. In fact, the 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of planet Earth. More lives were lost to war in the 20th century than in all of the other centuries combined. Yes, there's always been wars, but it hasn't always been like this. Let's take a look at Matthew 24, verses 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And it seems in the world today we're caught in a different type of war also, where everybody is offended over everything. And then new laws are passed, which incites more terrorist incidences, and, and on and on and on. And of course, here recently in 2016 also, there's been the attack on police and the attacks from police, and it seems like there can't be anything left that you can trust. But the Bible doesn't leave there. It continues in Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. I was out in school in California for a little while, and I had a friend that actually measured earthquakes for a living. And he showed me this very, very powerful graph. Take a look. And this tracks earthquake incidences from the 1900 all the way up to about 2008. And there's always been earthquakes, but this one, this graph me measures destructive, deadly earthquakes, bringing down houses, earthquakes. And if you look at the graph starting at 1900, there's earthquakes, and then it seems that there's a spike in around 1920 and 1935, but it's still, but it's still relatively even. And then you get to the 2000s and it goes through the roof. Why does it happen like this? There's always been war. There's always been earthquakes, but not like this. Things are getting worse, more intense on the planet that we live in. Now you notice there it says earthquakes in various places. This means that there would be earthquakes in places where there aren't normally earthquakes. And I live in, and I'm recording this now in Pennsylvania, and a few years ago, there was an earthquake that was felt in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania doesn't get earthquakes. I mean, I know that there's a really big bad fault line through here, but it's been inactive for so long, it doesn't happen. The world is awakening to the signs that Jesus pointed to. And another indicator of the signs of the times would be famines. Take a look at these statistics. 795 million people in the world do not have enough food. In fact, 12.9% of the population is undernourished. One in six children in developing countries is underweight. One in six children in America go to bed hungry every single night. I know a few people that are in the education system, and when there's a day off, it's, it's a very sad day for some of these students because the free meal at lunch is the only meal that they get. It's very sad and it's not that there's not enough food to go around, it's just that it's not distributed properly on planet Earth. And here we have two epidemics, two simultaneous epidemics, one of undernourishment and one of obesity as well. 34.9% of the population in America is obese. It makes no sense how this condition can exist. People starving and people obese at the same time. But this is a clear indication of the signs of the times that Jesus was talking about. Matthew 24 verse 7 says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Now that word pestilence there, we have to go into the original Greek wording a little bit to really understand what it's talking about. Typically when you think of a pest, you think of a, a bug that's eating your crops or something, and certainly that is a pest. But the word pestilence comes from the Greek word loimos, which means a plague. 
Think of a pest, a bug, as strange new bugs, strange new diseases. And we've certainly had our fair share of that in the past 30 or 40 years or so. Here are just a few of the strange new diseases that have come out. AIDS. AIDS was a huge epidemic and a big problem, and it still is today. SARS, the uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. You remember a few years ago, there was a big stink about that. Bird flu, swine flu, MRSA. Every hospital seemed to be having problems with MRSA. I know many people in healthcare that their patients were having these bed sores that were getting infected, and MRSA was the culprit. Zika virus, there's the recent outbreak with the measles again. Uh, the Ebola virus started to make its uh, ugly comeback. The Black Plague for a little bit was even coming back. And Lyme disease. Now, Lyme disease, I don't know that it's officially a, uh, a plague, but certainly, in my opinion, it is. I know a lot of people that suffer from this. Why? There's always been war. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been disease and pestilences, but not like this. Things are getting worse and worse. And the next verse gives us an understanding of how this could be. Matthew 24, verse 8 says, All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Other translations say all these things are the beginning of birth pains. Now, I have a friend that's a midwife, and I'm told that during the entire pregnancy of a woman, there's actually contractions. It just doesn't get to the point where you can feel them until towards the end of the pregnancy, of course. And generally, the contractions come in about three waves. There's the first wave towards the end. That's, you know, the body, it's, it's beginning to practice pushing out, and the torso contracts, and the, way, the woman begins to feel it. And it's sort of exciting to say, oh, that's sort of interesting. Something's finally happened. It's exciting. And then the second wave comes, and the contractions, they get longer, they get harder, they get more intense, and usually the woman says, well, this is interesting, it's exciting, but it'll be nice when it's over. Then the third wave comes. This is when the woman is ready to knock out the doctor and husband and take them down and say, why did you do this to me? But you know what? Of all the women that I've talked to as I give this Bible presentation to them, they all give me the same answer to the next question. I say, when, when you're about ready to give birth, how, what was the pain level? And they say, it was extraordinary. I couldn't hardly stand it. And I said, well, what happened to the pain as soon as the baby was born? Every single one of them say, the pain's gone. And me, I have two kids, but I haven't birthed the kids. I've seen them birth, but I haven't birthed the kids. And it blows me away how you can be in that much pain one second and no pain at all the next. Why is it? It's because where at one point the focus is all on the pain and what's happening, and then the next thing, the focus is on that beautiful brand new life. And that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. And that's why the prophecy says all these things are the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of birth pains. And that's when on planet Earth it seems that things are going to get so intense, it's going to get to the point where you wonder, God, how much more of this can I take? It seems like I can't take any more. And then when it gets to that point, Jesus is going to come back. And then the focus is going to be on that beautiful brand new life, and the pain will be a thing of the past. Jesus counsels us. He says, hang in there. You can do it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5 says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, there's always been false Christs and false apostles. Even in the time of Christ, there were false Christs. Even before the time of Christ, there were false Christs. They've always been around, and, but never like they are today. Let's take a look at just a few who have caused some issues in recent years. One was Marshall Applewhite. Marshall Applewhite led the Heaven's Gate cult to a mass suicide in 1997, which led to the death of 39 people. Why does something like this happen? It's because people are following a person rather than the Bible, or the God of the Bible. Just a few years before that, there was the issue with David Koresh, and they gave him a not-so-nice nickname. They called him the Wacko from Waco. In 1993, there was a raid on the Waco compound by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, which left 80 dead. How did it happen? 
David Koresh was a very charismatic person. People put their faith and trust in him. He claimed that Jesus Christ came the first time to live a sinless life, and now he had come as David Koresh the second time to lead a sinful life. People put their trust and faith in him, and it led to the death of many, adults, women, and children. And then there was Jim Jones, who in 1978 led to the largest mass suicide in world history. The story goes like this. He started out as a Methodist preacher in Ukiah, California. Started out by preaching from the Word of God in his presentations and then in his church sermons. He went to the point of stomping on the Word of God, jumping up and down on it during the sermons. Then he went to the extent of using the pages of the Holy Bible as toilet paper. People began to follow him, though. They began to believe his teachings rather than what the Bible actually said. He moved down to uh, Guyana, South America, and he developed his own town called Jonestown, and he was able to convince over 900 people to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, largest mass suicide in history. Adults, men, women, and children all taken as a result. And then here in our recent history, there was a man by the name of Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda who died in 2013 of cirrhosis of the liver. This man not only claimed to be Jesus Christ, but also claimed to be the Antichrist. In fact, he was able to convince his followers to tattoo the number 666 on themselves as an identifying point that they're following him. And he even had a website with a countdown clock, a countdown to the end of the world. Well, the clock came to an end, but the world did not. Time after time, we see people falling and putting their trust and faith in people rather than the Bible. Many, many lives would have been spared had they had the Bible study that you're having today. And I hope you stay tuned to next week for part two. But let's continue with the false Christ and false prophets. Some even claim that the Pope himself is God. Take a look at this, the gloss of extravagantes. But to believe that our Lord God, the Pope, the establisher of said decretal, and of this could not decree as he did decree, should be counted heretical. There you have it. There are some that claim that the Pope is the Lord God himself. The Bible says there is one God in three persons, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and when he comes back, everybody's going to know it. He's given us the signs of his soon return, so he can't be on earth right now. Matthew 24, verse 5 says, False prophets will rise up and deceive many. So now you see why Jesus' words at the beginning of this dissertation, he starts it out with, don't be deceived. By the way, this is how many could be deceived. And I hope you stay tuned, because when we come back, we're going to see how the love of many would wax cold. Why is there so much hate in families today? 6,000 years ago, God created a planet, Earth. There are now over 7 billion people on this planet. It is estimated that 2.7 billion of these people have never heard the gospel. It is our mission, our goal, to teach the world about the love of Jesus. It is our goal to help the world behold the Savior. Welcome back to Behold the Savior as we identify the signs of Jesus' soon return. So far we've seen signs in the religious world, the political world, and the natural world, but now let's see how the signs in our hearts of the nearness of Jesus' soon return. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now this is a key point as we identify the nearness of his return because it says lawlessness will abound. What law will it, is it that would be broken? Of course, it would be the Ten Commandments, God's ultimate moral guideline. Some of you might remember back in 2015, October 6th, where the monument of the Ten Commandments was removed from state property in Oklahoma. And this was really a telling story of our view of God's Ten Commandments. They've attempted to take it out of courtrooms, out of schools, out of government properties, everything. And what happens? If you take the Ten Commandments away from us, then we're left with no moral compass. 
And what do we end up? The inevitable result is exactly what the Bible predicted. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now, there's always been crazy things happening in family units today, but you've never seen people turning on each other like they do today. You've never seen so many parents leaving their kids in cars. You've never seen so many parents attacking their kids, kids attacking parents. Why? Because we've taken away the moral compass and we're paying for it now. And if we skip to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. The world seems to be shifting and striving for knowledge, but knowledge of what? And what ultimately is our standard of knowledge? Is it what the Discovery Channel says, or is it what the Bible says? Depends on your point of view of knowledge, doesn't it? But Jesus does not leave us without hope. He doesn't leave us with no encouragement. And back to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says this, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus knew that it would take some endurance making it through the things that he promised that, he would have, that we would have to go through. Not only did he promise us that we would have to endure, but he promises that he would be the one to help us endure. My favorite Bible promise is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. That means Jesus actually takes accountability on himself to help us, to assist us, to shape us, and to mold us. And one of those points of molding would be giving us endurance. But then he doesn't leave it there. In Matthew chapter 24, he commissions us with a great work to do. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. We've seen signs in the political world, the religious world, the natural world, earthquakes, famines, wars, pestilences, false Christ. But then Jesus said, by the way, it's not going to come to an end until the gospel reaches the entire world. That's really the final thing that must happen before Jesus can come back. And if the gospel has to go through the entire world, how is it going to get there? Jesus calls you to go share the love of him to your friends, to your neighbors, to your loved ones. Next time on Behold the Savior, we're going to identify how Jesus will return. We've seen about when he's going to return, the signs how we can identify his soon coming, but next time we're going to see how we're going to know if it's Jesus or not. Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we can gain encouragement. We live in a crazy world that's been turned upside down, but God, you've promised to be there with us through every step of the way. Encourage us, give us the endurance that we need, and help us to look more and more forward to Jesus' return. And we thank you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please like and share what you're learning on social media. Visit and like us on Facebook. Visit and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And visit and subscribe to the website at BeholdTheSavior.com. Thank you and God bless. Last time on Behold the Savior, we saw the signs of what the world would be like before Jesus would return. This week on Behold the Savior, we'll see what the actual literal return of Jesus will be like. How will he return? Find out on Behold the Savior.